Welcome to the Rock is George podcast. I'm your host, George Dion, and this is episode 83. Thank you for tuning into the podcast through our website, rockisgeorge.com, or on our YouTube page, or through one of the many podcasting streaming platforms, or at theloudest.com on the planet, knac.com. My guest for this episode is Canadian musician Lee Aaron. Lee Aaron wasn't marketed much to the States when I was growing up, but she bust on the scene with the Lee Aaron Project in 1982. She's most prominently known, I think, here in the U.S. for her 1984 release, Metal Queen. But Lee Aaron was so much bigger in her home country of Canada, with albums like Body Rock, Some Girls Do, Call of the Wild. I'm certainly a big fan of her last album, Radio On. And I'm also a fan of her current album, Elevate, which is set to release on November 25th through Meadowville Records. So here's Lee Aaron to tell you more about it. If I knew absolutely nothing about Lee Aaron, how would you describe your music to me? Melodic, bluesy, intelligent, hard rock. (laughs) Absolutely. And nothing that that couldn't be a better description of your upcoming album, Elevate, which comes out on November 25th through Metalville. Uh, Have you been sitting on this album for a little bit? Because it's been a while, a couple of years since your last album and everybody was locked down and everybody was kind of working from home. When Elevate comes out, it will be actually just a little over a year between albums. Um, Radio One was released in July of 2021. I don't know if you're aware of that. We released our Radio One and were gung-ho to get out there and do some shows to promote the album. We did two shows and then, of of course, last fall, the whole world went into lockdown again. And this was just as, you know, the middle of the vaccine rollout and everything. And so that was a little disappointing to us. And But they were like, okay, what can we do? Well, we can write more songs. (laughs) So we'd already been in the, the process of writing since Radio One. Uh, we had finished Radio One because we, you know, the whole world wasn't able to get on. We weren't able to get on planes and go tour, and so we had started writing. But um, I guess it was last June. We had about I don't know six songs written, and I said, Look, interestingly enough, I'd heard um, Jack White talking in an interview, and he said, you know, I just like book the studio time, and then I just force myself to get it together. And he said, I in in it's kind of like this frenetic you know, urgency to to write the songs. And he said, I find that I work better under those circumstances. Now, I've never done that to myself. And I just, but I thought that's kind of an interesting concept. So I booked studio time for August with Mike Fraser. We had about six tunes and I said, hey guys, we're going into the studio in August. <laughs> um, we need to write more songs and fast. You know what? It was kind of, it was exciting. Everybody stepped up to the plate in the band and uh, we started writing like crazy again. And um by the time we went in to record in August, we had 14 tracks, almost 14 tracks. Uh, we ended up writing one in the studio, Elevate, ironically, which became the album title. Uh, Ten of those tracks, of course, ended up on the, the new album. Um, and uh, we've got four uh, four secret tracks sitting here for some future project, which I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do yet. But it'll be cool whenever we do do it. But that it's kind of, yeah, Elevate is our COVID baby. <laughs> <laughs> And let's talk a little bit about the title track, Elevate, and obviously the song on the album. It sort of plays into this discourse that we have online and where we really shouldn't be uh, fighting with each other. We should be lifting each other up. There's so many horrendous things going on in the world besides a pandemic. You know, we've got a war. We're the closest we've ever been to the threat of nuclear nuclear war. I mean, Biden said that, what, yesterday? Uh, Or the closest we've been to the Cuban Missile Crisis. No, I'm not, you know, and I'm a super positive person, so I'm not saying this in a a negative way. You know, we had the uh, insurrection at the Capitol. We had, you know, just Black Lives Matter and all the the looting and the riots in the states. It was just, it's a, you know, school shootings. It's just kind of you know, maybe because I'm older and more mature now, I guess I pay attention to the news and I notice this stuff more. But it's uh, certainly give me, given me a lot to think about and a lot to, of fodder to to uh, expound upon and write about. I, I certainly think about these things. And um, while I, yeah, 
absolutely avoid posting anything even remotely political on my social media because it just sets you up to be attacked by people and to get people fighting on your all fighting on your social media platforms which is horrible um i sort of i spin it all into fun rock songs and i, <laughs> I put out albums and vent that way you know elevate is all is about elevate the the last track on the album and rock bottom revolution which is the first track are kind of you know polar tracks on the album where they 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 talk a lot about about how the whole cyber world is a place to enables people to polarize and and it, it's also a, a place that can be weaponized now which is really kind of crazy and scary um so you know i just i guess i just had a lot of feelings around that but with that said both those songs i mean rock bottom revolution is a it's an anthem that's why it opens the album and elevate is it's all about you know making a choice and making a choice to lift each other up to be a positive part of life in your community and um that's what we need to be doing is uh just stepping away from all of that craziness and putting our hearts in the right places Absolutely. And are you planning, uh, we're talking like six weeks before the album comes out. There hasn't even been a, a first uh, promotional video that I've seen yet. So are you, what are you planning to release for the first uh, song? Rock Bottom Revolution is the, is the first video. Uh, the first video will drop on October 28th this month. That's why you haven't seen it yet. It's actually being worked on by my my uh, video wizard in Toronto right now. He's uh, so awesome, Frank Greiner. He's done a bunch of stuff for Def Leppard recently, and uh, oh goodness knows, Mariah Carey. He's 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 huge. He works with everybody. He's amazing. So I'm really excited about that. You don't just have songs about what's going on in the world. You have some reflective songs on the album. Uh, certainly, I don't know if they're personally about you or if they're. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Parts of you or people you know, but you have some fun songs on there. If you want to talk about a couple of them, I mean, Troublemaker is a good place to start. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's not really about a personal experience, but it's more about maybe a personal experience I maybe would have liked to have had in the past. It's about escaping a bad relationship and then having that rebound relationship that comes suddenly and out of the blue and is spontaneous and probably reckless that breaks the heartbreak so that you're able to move on and it was just conceptually an idea that I had and so it just became sort of like a dream sequence in my head that turned into a, a song because you know hey that's what rock and roll is all about and uh one of the songs I really liked was the ballad uh Red Dress uh, that one was very piano-based ballad, and uh, I enjoyed it. Almost teared up a little bit. I've been married for a while myself, so Aww. kind of brought back memories and stuff of starting out. Was this reflective, or was this more of kind of how you wish you saw it? Well, no, I've been married for over 20 years to my husband, John Cody, who's the drummer in the band. Um, we have a really, you know, it uh, hasn't always been easy, just like everyone's marriage. I mean, you know, you know, we've hung in there through the years, and he's my rock man. Like he's a solid guy. Believe it or not, what kind of um, inspired that song was I was married previously when I was younger, my, um, my first marriage. And uh, that gentleman passed away from COVID. And it was, it was just quite a heartbreak because, you know, I think I, I looked back, it was a very, uh, I was quite young when I got married the first time. Um, he was a guitar player from Detroit, Michigan. We loved Prince music. That was our common bond. We went and saw Prince together. And so Red Dress is really kind of like a mishmash of like old memories and new memories put into the, the context of a song where I thought, wouldn't it have been nice if you we never made mistakes? We never got married more than once. And that could have been a lifetime relationship. So it really, it's, it's about my current relationship, but the first verse sort of reflects upon the past. I'm, I'm glad it made you tear up that I've my mission is accomplished. <laughs> Spitfire Woman kind of goes the other way. It's it's a little more, it's got a lot of oomph, a little sass to it as well. Oh, it's definitely a sassy, sassy track. Um, yeah, Spitfire Woman. Well, we had written this tune, the, the music for this tune, and I um, 
it's it's a bit bluesy and a little bit nasty and a little bit dark, which is, you know, of course, part of the Liaran sound. And a story that had stuck with me for many, many years. Years ago, John Albany, my first guitarist and co-writer, we were in Nashville writing with a guy named Todd Cerny. Um, he was a popular writer in the late 80s. I don't know, we were just bouncing ideas around and he told us this crazy story about a couple that he actually knew personally that ended up in the news down there where the the, the husband in the couple had, had an, an extramarital affair. The wife found out and was just unbelievable. She was like a firecracker, this woman. She was filled with rage and they got into an argument in the kitchen and she had she had this hanging rack and she picked up a cast iron frying pan and she hit him with it. She clocked him in the side of the head and he died. Not, and she wasn't expecting him this kind of a result, but this is what ended up happening. And she ended up, I guess, getting exonerated because they figured it was a crime of passion. And anyway, it was just, it was just the craziest story. And I, and it just stuck with me for years going and I, and I, when we wrote Spitfire Woman, I thought this is the perfect template for this story. And that's what I ended up becoming, of course, the song Spitfire Woman. And my wonderful friend, Karen Barg, uh, she is a fabulous electric violinist. Uh, I would say one of the top players in Canada. Um, she just recently played with The Who, um, was part of their orchestra when they came through town. And she just was one of the music directors for Michael Bublé when he came through Winnipeg. She's become a good friend, and I, I wanted to create a, a tune that she could play on um, because she does a lot of, you know, more, um, you know, pop culture or pedestrian kind of stuff. You know, not that The Who would be in, under that category, but she uh, she just loves rock and roll, and she's always asking me, you know, you've got to have a song I can play on, and so I sent her this one. I went, go crazy. So she... Um, played a dueling solo of course to Sean Kelly in that tune and she does this craziness on the outro which I just absolutely love so I had a lot of fun um producing that and working with that um in my home studio and then of course we handed it over to Mike Fraser for the mixes and um yeah it was just it turned out great now one of the great things I like about Elevate is it kind of continues what radio on it didn't really start but what i heard on radio on is that it's sort of a mix of different styles and musical compositions you don't really pigeonhole yourself to one genre even though i asked you what do you sound like you you sound like a lot of different things you're sort of like a uh, a melting pot of different genres so I, I i'm guessing you like to experiment and go different places well i you know i certainly would categorize the learn band as rock and roll it's rock i mean you know when you listen to those old fleetwood mac albums they don't stay in one particular mood if that makes any sense so it's you know the entire album has strong melodies it's got harm the you know kind of 80s style harmonies because i still love that sound it's got big gutsy nasty guitar but some of the songs meander into more of a bluesy flavor and more of a pop flavor. So I definitely wouldn't, I, I don't know that I would, myself personally, I wouldn't say different genres. It's all rock and roll. When I make an album, I like to take people on a journey. You know, I it's not, you know, there's very few artists that can stylistically stick to exactly the same sound and be successful at it. ACDC is one of those people. We might've discussed this before. You know, even Aerosmith has, you know, the ballad, the rock ballad on the record. And um, again, I, I keep going back to say maybe Bowie or Fleetwood Mac, where it'll meander into a few different places mood wise, but the album takes you on a journey. And that's that's the kind of album that I am interested in, in producing. I haven't seen anything on it yet, but is I know there'll be a digital version of the album, a physical CD of the album. Will there be a vinyl? Yes. <laughs> I just got an email actually from the label today because I'm going to, I ha I'm going to, um, and this is news because people don't know this yet. Um, there's going to be an exclusive version of the new album in uh, red vinyl available just on my web store in Canada. And the original version will be black. They were saying that they were, they were going to 
to ship it. And I guess these shipping costs have gone. They're like, it's going to cost this much to ship it to you. <laughs> How do you want to do this? Because I guess shipping costs have gone through the roof because of the fuel crisis. And uh, it's just the world is a crazy place right now. Hey, but yeah, it is coming on vinyl. In fact, vinyl seems to be making quite the resurgence right now. My uh, 16 year old son is just vinyl crazy. You know, he's, I, I hope, you know, he seems to be following in the footsteps of my husband. Unlike, you know, my 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 son has like 30 vinyls and my husband has 200,000. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. So okay. your your husband is also your drummer, John Cody. And yep. we discussed a little bit before the interview started that he collects vinyls. To, how do you listen to 200,000 vinyls in your lifetime? Well, you don't, but you never get bored. You know, he's, I don't can you say OCD a little bit, you know, like he's a little bit obsessive about it. So what will happen is that he will, he's a completist. So he'll have like the Elvis section and then he'll find out that there's a new or something that he did exists that he didn't know existed. And then he's on a mission to find it so, because he's a completist and he's got to have all of that artist's work. That's kind of how it works. And we recently moved and we are waiting on building permits right now because we have to, we literally, literally have to build like a small gymnasium to house all this stuff. It will be a library. It will be a library and a media room with a theater and things like that. But uh, it's crazy. Moving it was, it was like moving times 500. It was crazy. Uh, you were out on tour over the summer. You hit some festivals and whatnot. Did you preview any of the new material while you were out there? We, no, we didn't play it yet. We're not going to play it until the album actually comes out. But um, but we did get it, the opportunity finally to play some Radio On songs because we were essentially prevented from touring that album. So this summer was really lovely. We were able to go out and um, play some of the stuff from Radio On live, and it it went over really, really well. Excellent. And I saw that you um, just had a show on October 1st for the BC Cancer Foundation show, and you had like a who's who of Canadian rock and roll, Chili Whack, Lover Boy, Prism, Trooper, Nick Glider. Was it like, you know, uh, rock and roll high school reunion? It was. You know what? It was, it was such a wonderful event. And I was just talking to another journalist about this because we were talking about the song Elevate and about how important it is to lift each other up and to give back. And my husband and I have both been involved in various philanthropic efforts throughout our career. Although I don't, I don't really get online and advertise this too much because I'm not looking for notoriety for the good works. You know, that's not my, I know some people milk it, but, um, but yeah, we have a very good friend, uh, a gentleman named Rocket Norton, who was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He's a, He's a who's who guy in the Vancouver rock scene. He's played in prison and various other bands. And so when he found this out, his, I think he thought it was going to be his last big hurrah, although he was so energized by this event and the six, huge success that it was, it raised over $200,000 for cancer research here locally. His cancer apparently is, gone, I wouldn't say remission, but his, tr tr his tumors have shrunk which is crazy. So now he's planning uh, F cancer too. So it was just a, a beautiful event. We all got together. We all donated our time for free. It was just the right reason to be there. So it was like a big love fest. It was, it's like, we're all family now. And so, yeah, it, it was, it was even better than a high school reunion. <laughs> <laughs> and in 2023, you're going to be hitting the monsters of rock cruises. Is this the first time the Lee Aaron band has played on a, on a cruise ship? It actually is. We were scheduled to do this pre-COVID, but yeah, the whole idea of the thing seemed a little freaky, obviously, during a pandemic. But um, yeah, we're super excited. We've never done a cruise before, so it's going to be a first for us and a first for the fans. And, and of course, an opportunity for some of our American fans to finally get out there and see us because we've never done a lot of touring in the States. Uh, do you have any other tour plans or are you just going to hit uh, festivals? One of the things that we have found has been working really well for us as a band with our other commitments, because we have just, well, mostly our other com commitments are family and, and young kids. Uh, Sean Kelly, my guitarist, has young kids, and I still have children that live at home. 
Touring for long periods of time isn't something that's really super conducive to our life right now. However, we love to play live, obviously. So we found this unique way of just targeting places that we really want to play. So we've kind of got it down to fairs, festivals, casinos, and European festivals. And so we do these sort of pockets of dates throughout the year and try to hit as many markets as we can. And it's just been working really great for us. And uh, so, yeah, the cruise is going to be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned on your Facebook page um, last week or the week before that it was the 31st anniversary of Some Girls Do. And that was uh, the album that followed the highly successful Body Rock in 89. Uh, Some Girls Do was nominated for Rock Album of the Year, I believe, at the Juno Awards in 92. So was was there a lot of uh, pressure going in to follow Body Rock? And then what was it like when you know the album came out and the response to it? That's an interesting question. No, no one's ever really asked me. Yeah, was there pressure? I think whenever you have a successful album, there's... Uh, definitely a bit of pressure to follow that up so yeah truthfully it was a it was a little bit weird in the studio for, on some girls do because we um had um done body rock with myself and john albany we had a smaller budget for that record it's kind of a long story because um we didn't want to work with a producer that the label had really wanted us to work with so they they just cut the budget and said, there you go. Just make a record then. Just oddly enough, it ended up becoming our, our most successful record here in Canada. And then, so there were there was a little bit of egos in the studio for, for Some Girls Do. Um, you know, and then, of course, we brought in players for that album because we, John and I had programmed the drums and the bass and everything on Body Rock because we didn't have as big a budget. I, I think if I took anything away from that experience... Um, it was wonderful writing the songs. I think it was a super strong album. In fact, it was a, an album with a lot of feminist messages. Sometimes less cooks are better than more cooks when in the studio. Um, with that said, the album ended up being, you know, again, another wildly successful platinum album in Canada and subsequent touring for that album. So, um, you know, part of the pressure is the pressure you put on yourself and part of the pressure is the pressure you're feeling from the label because they want to follow it up with an, you know, an equal successful album because, and it's funny, once you have a successful record, you know, everybody wants to take credit for it, right? It's like, well, that was my idea. No, that was my idea. I always said those were great songs. And the truth is when we, when we played some of the demos for Body Rock to you know, there were, I don't want to say their names, but a couple of notable people in the industry in Canada, a couple of them said, you know, we, I don't know. I don't know if I hear it. And we were like, are you kidding? We totally hear it. You know, me and my co-writer. Um, and of course, we ended up being right in the end. It, it, it ended up being quite successful. But, um, you know, the good news now is that I don't think I would ever, ever do be a major label direct signing again. You know, the, 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 you don't need to anymore. The, the record industry has changed so much. Um, and I, I'm i just loving being in total creative control of my direction, of the artwork, of everything, and then finding distribution and licensing deals around the world and being able to be in control of my direction these days. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of digital technology is it's afforded that to us now, right, as artists. And I also saw online that some fans have immortalized Lee Aaron as a Lego action figure, as well as a pop vinyl action figure. What do you think about that? Oh, I think I think it's super cool. And in fact, you know, it's timely because my my son, who is now 16, has just gone through those. In fact, he's still a huge Lego fan. But, um, you know, when he was like, 12 13 years old the, the guy the kid had like 50 pops pop figurines in his room so it was um you know i can only consider it flattering to be um you know immortalized in these little little snippets of pop culture right mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact i got a i got a really cute uh text from the guy who uh the artist who did the lego figure uh, just sent me a Facebook message today saying, if I send you the actual copy of this, will you sign it? And so, yeah, that's 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 really cool. 
Well, now I think we need to get you in touch with Funko and we need to get the <laughs> final version of Lee Aaron throughout the years because I think it would be a great collection of action figures. <laughs> Possibly. You might be right. I'm still waiting for Metal Queen to end up in a female superhero movie. That's my goal. <laughs> ah, I, th I think you could get a comic book off of that. I think it would be a great idea. <laughs> Well, uh, those are all the questions I have for you today, Lee. I want to thank you for coming on the Rock is George podcast. A new album, Elevate, is out November 25th through Metalville and a couple other labels throughout the world. Yeah, well, we're distributed through Amped in North America, Ward, Sony in Japan. Um, so, yeah, you're going to find it everywhere. You know, go to your local Amazon. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> and the red vinyl will be exclusive through your shop. Through Rock Paper Merch in Canada, fully officially Aaron Web Store. Yep. Once again, I want to thank Lee Aaron for coming on the Rock is George podcast. Be sure to check out her latest album, Elevate, when it comes out on November 25th through Meadowville Records. Head over to your favorite music streaming app, take a listen to what's available. If you like what you hear, buy a physical copy, support the artist. For all things Lee Aaron, Head over to her website, leearon.com. I also want to thank Nathan T. Burke of Metalville Records for making this interview possible. You've been great. I've been George Dion. I'll see you again soon.